Good evening. I'm David Laws. I'm staff director of the Semiconductor Special Interest Volunteer Group here at the museum. And our charter is to work with the museum staff to collect the stories and the artifacts that illustrate the important role that semiconductors have played in the development of computing technology. And I'll be presenting this evening's computer history moment. When I talked to uh, Nora Robinson at Applied Materials about an appropriate semiconductor-related artifact to uh, uh, show you tonight, um, she told me about the Precision 5000 uh, chemical vapor deposition system. This was introduced in 1987. It had a significant impact on both the, the company's fortunes and has also been honored uh, by being included in the uh, Information Age exhibit at the Smithsonian Institution. I had visions of cruising into the auditorium, driving one of our new high-tech forklift trucks carrying a Precision 5000 system, but unfortunately management said no. <laughs> Instead, I've selected an item that's made possible by machines such as a Precision 5000, a silicon wafer. In fact, two wafers. Together they tell the story of the extraordinary developments in our industry over the 40 years since the founding of Applied Materials. This two-inch wafer represents mainstream 1967 manufacturing technology. This 300 millimeter dinner plate size wafer is today's high volume production standard. This guy held a few thousand transistors at most. This one, a single chip on here, can hold half a billion to a billion transistors. Just imagine how many there are on a whole wafer. And thanks to uh, 40 years of uh, magic from applied materials and others, this has been made possible. To tell you the story behind the story, I'd like to take you to the Silicon Engine website. This is a site that can be accessed from the museum's welcome page here. And developed with uh, funding from the Moore Foundation, the Silicon Engine presents 50 plus milestones in the development of semiconductor technology and its application to computers. Jump back here. <laughs> the timeline begins with Michael Faraday's 1833 description of the semiconductor effect. And concludes uh, with the single chip digital signal processor in 1979. Each milestone on here opens to a page of text, images, and lists of historical resources. My goodness. Got it. <laughs> Applied Materials is one of the companies featured on this milestone page head headed uh, turnkey equipment suppliers change industry dynamics. Before this time, semiconductor companies handcrafted much of their own equipment and all of their own processes. After 1967, third party equipment vendors emerged as a dominant force in the industry. This transition resulted in a shift of responsibility for the development of manufacturing technology to the equipment suppliers. And this in turn allowed new semiconductor vendors to focus their resources on product architecture and applications rather than process and manufacturing expertise. It also enabled the rise of wafer foundry vendors who supported the new breed of fabulous semiconductor companies that emerged in the 1980s. And at this last event, and at the last event in this series, Morris Chang of TSMC told us about the critical role that wafer founders play in the industry today. We look forward to learning more from Jim Morgan on the role that applied played in this dramatic change in the industry. So thank you for your attention to this computer history moment, and thank you to Applied Materials for the donation of this 300 millimeter wafer to the collection, and also for the company's generous contribution to the museum's silicon industry legacy fund last year. I'd now like to introduce you to uh, museum trustee Dave House, to tell you about the rest of this evening's program. Good evening and welcome. I'm Dave House and I'm uh, Vice Chairman of the Board of Trustees here at the museum and I'm also co-chair of the Semiconductor Special Interest Group, a group that we formed just a few years ago. Uh, Dave Laws has been providing the staff support for this organization in the last couple of years. 
I want to thank tonight, thank uh, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation for its generous support of the special interest group, the semiconductor special interest group here at the museum, and amongst many other things, making possible tonight's event. This is the third event sponsored by uh, the Moore Foundation, uh, and it's the, it's the, the final of the three. And uh, it's let us hear the stories about uh, the, many of the pioneers in the industry and the key events and happenings during the industry. And we'll be welcoming, welcoming uh, Jim Morgan here tonight for his uh, pioneering effort as, as well. Uh, how many of you are here at the museum for the first time? Raise your hand if it's the first time. So I see uh, uh, several of you here. Uh, uh, good news is it's less than it used to be a few years ago because more people are coming and coming back to the museum. But uh, the museum has been in existence really for over 25 years, and it's been dedicated to the preservation and celebration of computing history. It's expanded in recent years to cover semiconductors and semiconductor and uh, rotating disk memories and uh, software and special interest group activity. Here in Mountain View and in our warehouse in Milpitas, we house the largest collection of computing artifacts in the world, and this collection is growing on a day-by-day -day basis. Uh, we also bring computing history to, li uh, to life through a number of different uh, activities. Our website, uh, David Laws showed you uh, some of the semiconductor content on our website, uh, and uh, we have 10 different exhibits online, and we hope to have, over time, uh, a cyber museum that's available universally around the world of everything that's in the museum and more with the ability to go much deeper. We also have some the beginning of some exhibits. Our first big uh, public exhibit will be the timeline of computing history that will open up in the fall of next year. Uh, however, we uh, have our beta site test on a exhibit downstairs, the Mastering the Game, a History of Computer Chess in our lobby. Uh, innovation in uh, Silicon Valley or in the Valley, Innovation 101 uh, is uh, also down in the lobby. And of course, visible storage isn't really an exhibit, it's just some of our collection, a few percentage points of our collection on exhibits with some place placards and some uh, and docents. And docents are uh, available this evening down in visible storage and during the breaks. We also obviously run a speaker series, and this is one of those uh, uh, events. And we have a host of other activities that I won't go into. Before we start our program and I make the first introduction, I, would, I just want to make three announcements. First of all, uh, if you came in the lobby and noticed the black draping on the right, and if you peeked around behind it, you would see a five-ton piece of equipment with 80,000 8,000 working pieces. It's the Babbage Difference Engine Number 2. He designed more than one. This is the second one he designed. It was designed by Charles Babbage between 1847 and 1849 and not built during his lifetime. But in 1992, the London Museum of Science, from his plans, built the first Babbage engine. And it worked. And it did everything that he said it would do. And the second and probably the last one is the one that's downstairs recently completed, complete with a printer that prints out all the mathematical tables that it calculates, all mechanical, a real amazing uh, piece of, of engineering and uh, of art. We're going to be uh, 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 introducing this, the Babbage uh, exhibit, which will run for one year here in the museum this Saturday, which is, uh, uh, I'm sorry, next Saturday, which is May 10th, we're going to have an open house from um, 12 noon till 5 p.m. We're going to have Babbage engine demos during the day where we're going to crank the, we're going to set the numbers in the dials and crank the crank and out will come some results. Uh, we've had uh, a couple, calling them technicians wouldn't be right, scientists from London here. I've been watching them over the last several weeks working on this machine and getting it all tuned up and operating. Um, and we'll be operating it uh, uh, on the 10th. Uh, at uh, 1 p.m. and at 3.30, we're going to show the Ada Lovelace film. Ada Lovelace was uh, the partner of uh, Charles Babbage, and uh, uh, the uh, film is called To Dream uh, Tomorrow. 
and will be introduced by Doran Swade, who is from the London Museum of Science and as was responsible for the construction of the uh, Babbage engine. He will be uh, giving us a lecture at 2.30 that afternoon uh, covering the life and works of Charles Babbage and special attention to difference engine number two. Second announcement is um, we've changed our uh, audience Q&A format uh, tonight, and you'll find that uh, you have question cards on your chair or they'll be made available to you. And 8 o'clock, we're going to have we're going to ask you to pass them down to the end of the aisle, and someone's going to come by and uh, pick them up, and by 8.15, we'll uh, assemble them and deliver them to the podium. So you can finally... Uh, help us, help support us at the museum in terms of our efforts to get additional funding going forward towards the Semiconductor Special Interest Group by filling out at the end of the evening the survey that's on your chart. Uh, this is one of our deliverables that we owe to the Moore Foundation, and we'd like to have this uh, survey back so we uh, not only can complete that obligation, but we can use this for future uh, fundraising as well. So. With that, let me now introduce our, our interviewer, Dan Hutchinson. He's CEO of VLSI Research. I think most people here in the Valley know him because he's been highly visible for the last uh, 30 years, and during that time has been associated with Jim Morgan in a number of different ways. Uh, as a well-known uh, visionary in the industry uh, for the semiconductor industry, uh, he has uh, known most of the executives here in the Valley and the leaders in the Valley. He's also uh, published uh, numerous uh, publications. He's uh, developed many industry models. He's re researched just about every aspect of the semiconductor industry. Um, nowadays, he spends his time mainly advising companies in, in strategic and tactical marketing and business management and manufacturing trends and in productivity and strategy. He has a master's degree in economics from San Jose State. He studied engineering at UC Berkeley. Dan. One of my first projects was for a company called Eaton who made truck axles, and they were interested in buying applied materials. And at the time, Applied had just come out of its time, you know, where it was really terrible. It was a basket case. And the stock was starting to rise very quickly. And it turned out that it never went through because by the time I finished the project, uh, Jim had engineered such a turnaround that had they have bought uh, Applied Materials, he would have been the largest stockholder in Eaton. <laughs> just because of the difference of the two PEs. So... You know, that sort of uh, is a good prelude to uh, Jim. He came to Applied in 76, and he's probably one of the longest-standing CEOs in the Fortune 500. And, you know, I could talk about, you know, his medals uh, and, and different awards that he's gotten, and we'd be here till tomorrow. Uh, but he's gotten the National Medal of Technology. He's gotten the SIA's Bob Noyce Award. And what's amazing is, is he hasn't really been known for being a great technologist like a lot of people that get interviewed here. He's been a great catalyst of what's happened. And, and in fact, when I think of Jim, you know, he's been an executive, he's been a statesman, but most importantly, he's been a catalyst for our industry. And also, you know, one of the most, uh, when I think about him and when I think one word, I always think integrity because of, of his integrity. So anyway, I'd like to invite you up, Jim, and, and uh, start talking about uh, how it came to be. So you're really not from the Valley, are you? How'd you get here in the first place? Huh. By accident. Uh, uh, you know, I was, uh, I grew up in the Midwest uh, in a family equipment uh, or a family canning company. So I got some exposure to equipment and manufacturing and service, uh, which I didn't know I'd need later, but it was good. Uh, uh, fortunately, I got into Cornell, uh, got my engineering MBA, did my tour in the Army, and 
went with Textron, and they eventually sent me to Northern California to a company some people here probably know called Dalmo Victor. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had the part of a Dalmo Victor that was in trouble for a while. And, uh, and then uh, they were wanting to move me back to the East Coast, and I thought, Becky and I talked that over. And uh, we decided that between us we could figure out how to make a living on the West Coast, and so we <laughs> told them we were going to stay. Fortunately, I got a chance to work in the venture capital business mm -hmm. uh, for four years with a group called Westvan, which was a, a Bank of America and Weiss Peck and Greer partnership, and some venture capital guys some of you probably know, like uh, uh, Burge Jameson, Rick Flugel, uh, people like that, um, and Phil Greer. And so I did that for four years and kind of got the urge to get back to doing something. But one of the interesting things I had <laughs> happen to me while I was at, at um, uh, Dalmo that got me a little oriented to the valley or gave me a little exposure to the valley. And that was one day uh, the president... Uh, they had this Western Electronics Manufacturer Association, some of you now know it as the AEA, were having a dinner down in the Palo Alto Country Club, and uh, Roy Ash, who's probably most people here have never heard of, but he was your first uh, head of the Office of Budget and Management for the country. And he was a, uh, one of the uh, CEO of Lytton Industries, uh, President of Lytton Industries was going to speak, and so the head of our group couldn't go, and his number two couldn't go, so they ran into me in the hallway and said, Jim, would you like to go? We got to take it. I said, sure, I'll go. I didn't have anything that night, and uh, I went, and so <clears throat> the group that were there were uh, Bill and uh, Hewlett and uh, Dave and the Berrien Brothers and uh, kind of all the names that some of you probably have heard of in the valley, you know. There's about 50 people there and me. And uh, so I, I thought, geez, these are pretty interesting people. So it was uh, kind, of a, kind of my intro to below uh, Belmont, uh, where, I, <laughs> where I was. Anyway, that's how I got here. So um, what led you to apply in the first place? Well, I wanted to go back to running a company, or run, running something. Uh, I, I wasn't a, a very satisfactory venture capitalist. I, I really needed to kind of be in the... I've never been a good spectator sportsman. I kind of like to be in the action. So I, I, uh, my partnership said they'd support me if I could find a company run, kind of like this executive in residence deal that some of them do now. And I looked, and, you know, they had some great opportunities in Huntsville, Alabama, and uh, Kansas <laughs> City, and, and uh, uh, Ohio. And, and I was having a hard time finding something between San Francisco and San Jose, which was one of my criteria. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, Applied was uh, uh, Sandy Robertson uh, took Applied public in 72. So this was in 76. Um, and I had a discussion uh, with uh, Mike McNeely, who was a founder of, uh, of Applied, and, and he asked me if I'd consider coming there. And I said I would if I could have a free reign to kind of do what it need, needed. And uh, so the board asked me uh, if I'd come. Um, I was a little worried about that because they were, uh, you know, I was only 30 some, 35, 36, and I didn't look very old. I, I looked about 30. <clears throat> so I frosted my hair just a little bit here. <laughs> uh, my kids kind of kid me about that once in a while because they're about the only people till now that know that story. But because of that old look that I had, the experienced look they offered me the job. <laughs> of course, it was about to go bankrupt, so not many people wanted it. As yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the interesting things is, you know, in those days, a lot of people that went into the VC industry, they turned the companies around and, and, uh, and then they left. Uh, but you stayed. And, uh, you know, what was it that you saw at the time um, about the industry that you found so attractive? Um, 
Well, frankly, all my friends thought I was crazy uh, that to join the industry at that time because it been to it kind of wasn't established, didn't have a good reputation, and it was a pretty tough industry. We'd had oh, a couple three couple three cycles. Just while Applied was founded in forty in sixty seven, so this was seventy six, and um, the investors and the board were kind of used to some variations in the revenues, but uh, they were really, uh, uh, the industry came back and applied didn't in 76, so it was clear something needed to be done. And it was really running out of cash, so that's why they were willing to take me in. Uh, but, and my really original goal was just to get it turned around. Uh, I didn't have much of a, uh, because it wasn't clear we'd make it. Um, Fortunately, we were able to get enough cash out of the business that we didn't have to raise any equity. Uh, the B of A helped us, and uh, we got some tax loss carry backs, uh, which helped us a little bit. And we started shutting down about five out of six businesses. So my goal originally was just to get it to survive. Uh, but after I got out of about five out of six activities, um, I began to look at the possibilities with the company. And the more I looked, the more I thought, you know, the industry is in its infancy. I looked around, didn't see any other company that really deserved to be a leading company, particularly. Uh, you know, Perkin Elmer was there, it was a lot of very, and there's a lot of fairly good, reputable companies in those, but none of them really necessarily ought to win. They weren't really focused, were they? They were. In yeah, a lot they of were different diversified. Areas. Most of them. This was kind of an adjunct to their business. So I cut it back from about 26 million to 14 on a run rate, and uh, with that 14, uh, we we focused on the equipment business and began to build that. And after about a year, and spend some time in the industry, I thought it'd grow. So I uh, first thought, well, if we could get it to 50, maybe we'd sell it. But then another year or so, spent some more time thinking about it, and it's clear it was kind of a fundamental uh, key to the information age eventually, and so mm -hmm. we stayed with it. What was it like trying to get money for a tech company in those days? How was this, when you look at the stock market, what was the valuations, that sort of thing? Well, I think, you know, I, did, I looked at the tech companies that were coming when I was in the venture business because the industry was so bad. I mean, I mean high tech was in such a bad name. Actually, when applied materials became public, uh, Sandy Robertson suggested we take the, it used to be called applied materials technology. And so Sandy said, well, you know, you ought to take technology out. It really is a bad name, bad term. So that's why it's applied materials. And I couldn't understand why my customers kept, well, AMT, or we like AMT, or you did this at AMT. Uh, who the hell's AMT? And, and it turned out it was us. So, uh, 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 but it worked. And, and so, so I, I, um, I looked at that time, because we were looking at, in the venture business, looking at buying public companies as, uh, as a possibility. It wasn't our charter. And I think I figured out that if you took Varian and Hewlett Packard out of the companies, a pool of high tech companies, I think the total valuation of high tech companies in Silicon Valley was somewhere between 500 million, 750 million dollars. You could have bought them all. Wow. AMD was about bankrupt, or I mean they weren't because they owned all their land and stuff. Applied, I, I must have been about twelve million dollars. Intel was maybe thirty million dollars, uh, or, or maybe maybe a hundred million dollars. Intel was a little bigger, but it, you know you add them all up, it was less than it was. It wasn't a big number. Timeshare, a lot of companies people would know. So that must have been a pretty attractive force for you because you knew the growth was going to be high, right? Not really. I, I just <laughs> I just needed a job in the Bay Area that you know and that would keep two kids and a wife paid. You know, so uh, it just worked out okay. <laughs> so um, if you look at Applied today, it's you know you've been close to ten billion dollars in revenues. How'd you get it there? 
Well, after the after we got the, the blood, the, the cash flow turned around, and we had a real opportunity for a return on investment for those financial types that are here, because we had a million in equity and nine million in debt. And so uh, if you could get any earnings, your return on equity would, was well leveraged and would have worked really well. Uh, so we set up a strategy that we get uh, a broadened product line, uh, that we would uh, diversify our markets, not by industry, but into different geographies, because primarily we were uh, selling in the U.S. and some in Europe. Uh, and so the, the whole goal of the management team, once we got the survival side taken care of, was to see how many new products we could get out and how many new markets we could successfully penetrate. And, and we, we were pretty successful in that. Uh, it worked really well. Yeah, it's interesting in the, the early documents that you were circulating to people, one of your key vision points that I read was uh, your belief in persistence mm -hmm. and how important that is uh, to making a company. When you're really down like that, yeah. uh, it's a fascinating concept. I don't know where I picked that up, but I have a, have a as you know, I have a sign in my office that, about people, intelligent people and so forth, but the key is perseverance and persistence. And so... That became kind of a motto at Applied, and uh, uh, we just, uh, we were kind of relentless, and that works since we were a cyclical business, because every time times would get tough, kind of the whole group would really hunker down and, and take advantage of that. And so we always kind of blew out of these, the, or uh, really took off in the upturns uh, every time. Uh, and I think it's just because, uh, and people really got... Uh, they, they, they weren't, they didn't get depressed and, and stop performing. They, everybody kind of engaged and, and hunkered down. And, and when we came out, we, we'd always grab some market share and grab some uh, new products and get some new people. And, and we just always enhanced the company. I just, it was a relentless kind of thing. Yeah, I know. A lot, that's a word a lot of your competitors use to describe you. <laughs> 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 you know, and, and it's really funny because in the early days of the industry, you're right, the Perkin Elmers, these companies, they were all big corporations and people went home at 5 o'clock. And, yeah. and it was a very different world. The uh, um, Now, one of the things you did that was really fantastic was you cleaned up the product line and applied. How did you decide what stayed and what went? Uh, well, the way I always evaluated product lines and, and what we were going to do and not do is that I'd go through our our talent pool, and we if we had a good concept and we had a core team, then we'd fund it. And when we kind of ran out of core team, then we stopped funding. I mean, we just uh, so that's kind of how we got out of the hot wall business mm -hmm. in, in the in eighty one. And we were about five, six years before we came back in with the CBD 5000, which really took over the industry, um, because we had the third team on the hot wall business. And, you know, you just, I, I just never won with third team. So when we ran out of really top-notch teams, we kind of stopped. I remember Bob Graham telling me this story about, because you brought him in to, to run marketing from Intel, and he said that the, there was the hot wall furnace that you had and there was so much vibration from the pumps that uh, the wafers were circling in the boats. <laughs> and Bob said, who in the hell would want to buy this thing, and why would they want to buy it from us? And the engineers said, because we're applied materials. <laughs> and he said that was when he knew they had to kill it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And it was, it's amazing how those things uh, turn. Now, one of the most interesting things that I find about you that I think most people don't know is we've all learned in the last maybe five or ten years from Jack Wells how important people are. But one of the interesting things about Jim, if you go back, you always focused on people from the very beginning. You know, you weren't really focused on technology as much as the people like your point about 
you made the choices by whether we had the core team or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I I, uh, I learned really back at the faculty that there are really good people, and then there's some that aren't quite as good. And then in the venture business, I had a lot of chance to select people you know, for jobs. So I, uh, and I always believed in having the best people and, and giving them enough emotional space that, that they could be part of the management. In other words, they didn't, they, they weren't subordinated to me for emotional space. I didn't take up all the emotional space. And I think that was probably important because people like Dan are really proud and capable guys. This is our, Dr. Maiden, who was our president. Jim Bagley, who was our president for a while, Bob Graham, a lot, lot of really, uh, really, really competent people uh, have been at Applied, fortunately. I think probably that was, uh, that allowed them to stay for kind of the full, till, till they kind of, either the business changed and somebody mm-hmm. else needed to kind of carry it forward, or they stayed the whole way till they retired. I remember you hired uh, Glenn Tony. Yeah. And... Uh, one of the things that I found really fascinating about one of your annual reports is, because every year and you're in my business, you have to go through every single annual report. You were the only tech company that, that featured the guy from HR. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know. Well, actually, I, when I came to apply, uh, and I knew this from my investing in, uh, through the venture industry in, in uh, Silicon Valley, is that when I came came to apply, I probably knew every venture capitalist and every high tech in the top three executives here. I mean, it's hard to believe today. I don't even know the people in my subsector of the bit of our business. But but it was a small world then. And uh, uh, but the one thing I kind of learned from talking to him, nobody paid much attention to human resources. And so I looked throughout all the, for the number two human resource person in every company in the valley. And I finally got somebody from Johnson & Johnson because I knew from my history on the East Coast that they really had a pretty good HR group. And so I brought that in and, and emphasized that early on. Uh, and there's a lot of things that we did. We always made kind of, we made sure that people could talk through the HR group, and we'd resolve issues with managers way down there. Because, you know, some engineers aren't great managers. Uh, some are, I'm not saying that, but, but some of ours weren't. And so having a little help there really, really was useful. And, and then um, a little later on, I, I learned of Glenn Tony, who was really one of those outstanding people who, he's a PhD computer scientist. Uh, but he was the assistant superintendent at the Palo Alto High School, uh, at the Palo Alto High School District. And so he was going to go into the industrial side, so I brought him in in training. And then he eventually kind of was our social conscience and our human resource conscience for many years and uh, was one of the great contributors to the Valley, of course, um, because I just felt it was really important. And, 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 you know, most of our people, you know, some people got better opportunities and that, but big core group of our people been there a long time. And speaking of those, those annual reports, one of the things I also noticed is, is that a lot of companies really cater to the shareholders as if they were the only stakeholders. But if you look at yours, it's not clear that you always had this single-minded focus on shareholders. Uh, no, the, yeah, I, I always believed that you, you had multiple stakeholders and you had to manage the all the the executive team had to be responsible for all of them. Uh, We had to be responsible for the customers first um, and the employees um, and the uh, uh, the shareholders, of course, and our suppliers and partners that we had uh, and the community. And and so we we always believed that and our board believed that and and we followed that, uh, that cultural thing. Because I believe that the, the shareholders would make out long term if we kept it balanced. Uh, you can do a lot of things for shareholders on a short term basis, but if you, if all of those five aren't supporting your organization over a long period of time, you, you there's no way you're going to build a, a great company. And really after, 
in 78, we concluded that, and we put that in our mission statements, it seemed a little crazy when you think back at it, but uh, that we were going to be the leading supplier of semiconductor equipment and services uh, on a global basis or something close to that. And at that time, we were maybe $20 million. And, uh, and we did, you know. And, and I think a lot of us, because kind of all the stakeholders hung in there with us during tough times and, and, uh, and gave us breaks. And, and so it worked. One of the interesting things is that if we fast forward into the early 80s, you, got, you get appointed to be head of SEMI. Oh, right. um, of the board, right? And one of the jokes in the industry was is that at that time, whoever got to the head of SEMI, usually their company went in decline. Right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. And you were I was first. a little nervous about taking that job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But one of the first things you did, uh, I mean, it's interesting because if you have the focus on people, you can leave to go do these things. But the other thing is, is you really had a focus on industry. You went to Walt Matthews, who was doing PR for Semi at the time, and you told him that uh, the world needs to see equipment, and the equipment industry is a separate industry from chips. What was that all about? Uh, you know, I've wondered about that. Um, it, it seemed obvious. Um, I, I think maybe... When I was young, when I was a teenager, my dad used to take me to the trade shows for the canners and food canners and distributors, I think it was. It was usually in Chicago. And and I really liked the people in the industry. Uh, fortunately, I didn't go in the industry. I almost did. but uh, And I just felt the industry was important. And as I got to semi... Uh, you know, at that time it wasn't a big organization like it is today, but I think we had, we had eight board members and an executive secretary and two clerks or something like that. Uh, and the eight board members did a lot of work. Um, and I just felt that, uh, we needed to work together to, to have a position in the industry. Because you have to remember that our customers didn't think highly of us particularly. Um, uh, most of them really believed that they could manage our businesses better than we could, and uh, they may have been right, uh, although the ones that have come in have taken them a little while to make that transition, I've noticed, uh, because it's a tough business. And uh, I just thought that if we could get our business, our people, our group together, we could have a more uh, effective relationship with our customers. And also felt that we had to get standards in place. And so that semi was the best way to get standards in place because all of our customers were having different wafer sizes and they were all trying to differentiate. Notches versus Notches, flats I mean, and all that stuff. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so if we didn't really get our industry pulled together, uh, that was, we weren't going to be successful with them. And then also the investment community, I mean, they didn't, know us from anything. And so one of the jobs that Walt had and others was to build our relationship with Wall Street and, and, and I think that was important uh, and also with the governments. And so eventually SEMI evolved to you know be an influential organization on a global basis. It's interesting because that's something you really have in common that I learned from Bob Noyce also I learned it from you mm -hmm. is, is just the importance of industry and that to really rise as a company, you have to have a sense of industry, not just a sense of your own corporation. Yeah. And uh, I think that's characteristic because you're both Intel's a leading company, Applied's a leading company. You mentioned earlier that you started to look at the global part of the world and you were looking, you know, Applied was selling primarily in the United States um, and Europe. One of your great legacies is the push into Japan. In fact, I can remember um, when GE was talking about how great they were going to be in Asia, you already had something like 40 or 50 percent of your business in Japan, and nobody else could crack it. Um, why don't we talk about that a little bit? 
Um, okay. Well, when I came to Applied in 76, I had, I, I'd never been outside of North America. Um, so my first trip outside of North, North America was to Japan in 77 to our trade show. And I was very impressed. I happened to go JAL. Uh, I was very impressed with, from the time I got on the plane till I got there. Of course, when I got off, in those days, the, you have this choice. You come into Narita Airport, and there's two, there's, says, uh, uh, Japanese. That's one of the lines you can go through on immigration. And then the other one was aliens. <laughs> So I was kidding my friends that that was one of those uh, barriers to, to trade, but it, uh, uh, it's not that they thought you were different. I just, uh, but I was impressed with the quality. I was impressed with the relationship between the customers and the suppliers and uh, by the people I met and uh, by a young fellow named uh, Iwasaki-san, Tedesco Iwasaki who was the salesman rep for the trading company we had. You didn't have an organization that applied at No, the time, we, right? we were working through Kahnemann's at that time. And uh, when I got back on the plane to go home, I, I'd already made a decision in my mind that we really had to go direct in order to get to the customer. And so a couple of years later, yusaki san had been uncomfortable with his trading company and was going to go off on his own. And so uh, Bob Graham and I talked to him, and, and uh, we decided to kind of set up our uh, unapplied materials uh, Japan. And uh, uh, he led that from the beginning and did a great job. And the customers were willing to work with us. And uh, well, Overnight, you were really big. Yeah. Right. And, and so we began to, you know, we had credibility. We had good products. Some good, we didn't have many, but we had some good products. And uh, we, we, they, once they believed that we were committed to them, because the big problem in those days, most U.S. companies or foreign companies would commit, and they come in, you'd sell you some stuff, and then they'd disappear. If a downturn, they wouldn't support you. So they were, they were pretty much uh, determined to set up their own industry. And, uh, and we gave them an alternative to that. And then over time, uh, we eventually became a leading supplier in Japan in our industry as well as every other geographic region. And it kind of set the model for the going direct in all the uh, other geographic regions. It was, it's one of those funny things about your history was in those days you had Europe, U.S., and ROW. Right. And you had this guy, Bill Delaney, who Bill used Delaney. to be in charge of ROW, and he used right. to have this funny thing he always said. Uh, he, he'd come home, you know, and he'd, he'd say, well, I'm in charge of the rest of the world. <laughs> and, uh, and that kind of kept shrinking. Well, it kept growing, but it kept shrinking because that, once we got a unit to be big enough, we'd spin it out as a separate group. <laughs> uh, actually, our strategy at that time was I felt if we could do a good job in the U.S., and we could hold our position, this is in the early 80s, in Europe. And Europe was really having tough times, and, uh, and we were able to, uh, and we decided that we'd stay there and continue to invest. And uh, we began to get, uh, we decided we'd upgrade our management. In fact, Franz, are you here someplace? There he is. Franz got hired about that time. He was working at IBM, and he came to us, and... Uh, uh, Van Leeuwen and some of that group, and and so we actually accelerated our efforts again in in Europe at a time when everybody else was cutting back. So we came out of that. We lost money probably two three years, but but we came out of that with a solid position in Europe, solid position in U.S. So as we started competing more uh, get tougher in in Japan, we had a real uh, a collective mass that was effective. And fortunately for us, the uh, Japanese companies were kind of hesitant about going outside of Japan, and uh, so we got, and, uh, and we that began to build our global culture, which is just one of the great strengths of applied uh, today, uh, and has been for I don't know, a couple decades. One of the interesting strategies that you took that I always found interesting was most companies they create like an organization in Japan and then they go back to business as usual. 
you looked at it and says, gee, we want to have 30, 40 percent share of, of the global market. We want to have that share coming from Japan. And so you just said to your people, all your VPs and everything, you're going to spend that percentage of your time in Japan. Yeah, we took, uh, you know, it was clear at that time that most of our people didn't have a clue about Japan. Uh, and I didn't really either, but, but we, we, we were determined to learn. So in 84, uh, we took 20 people, from top people from around the world, and, uh, and about six from Japan. And we went to Japan for 10 days. And we went to the trade show. We went to a marketing program. Uh, we went out and visited Honda City, a Honda assembly plant. Um, we went to Ma Skiji. Anybody been to Skiji at 4 in the morning? Uh, that's a fish market in downtown Japan. Uh, and the other thing we, we did, uh, we went to a, a middle school on Saturday morning at 8 o'clock. And you had a choice when you got there. You could go in and sit with the students who were taking English, or you could sit with the students who were taking math. And between the trip to Honda, the trade show, uh, the visit to the middle school, it didn't. It, it, it became very obvious to our management team that we had to get our act together uh, to compete because the Japanese were coming clearly, and uh, and that w that worked out to be a great bonding experience because I hired people from GE and TI and IBM and different places and AT and T, and it really gave us a chance to kind of get our act together collectively and to see the same thing and to think about the same thing. And we spent a couple of days on the weekend uh, in two teams. Uh, one team was a applied and another team was like Tel, Tokyo Electron, uh, a Japanese company that we were going to compete with. And so we had both of them strategizing how to beat, beat the other one. And we came back with a pretty good uh, vision about being successful in, in Japan. What's so amazing about that is I remember a meeting with uh, the head of NEC Manufacturing in the late 80s, early 90s, and he was complaining to me because he couldn't get his people to buy from Anelva sputtering systems. <laughs> and Anelva at the time was owned by NEC, and they, were, they had been the world's largest sputtering system, and you guys were just rolling over them. And, and, and I said, so why can't you buy from them? You can just tell them to buy. He says, no, I can't tell them to buy. They have to make the decisions themselves. I said, so what is it they like so much about Applied? And he says, well, they're just as good. They have all the best things about a Japanese company, and they have all the best things about an American company, and so you can't beat them. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Well, one of, one of the things, actually, with NEC uh, were very helpful. Um, uh, NEC agreed to uh, help us with our quality, and uh, and so they uh, they let us they took us to one of their best factories and took us there for several, our top management team, about 20 people, not the same time. This was a different time and a different group or some different group, and they went through everything they did from the, what the worker did to how they took care of the equipment to how their engineering processes uh, relative to the quality program. And so we had a lot of help from Japanese companies. Uh, Toyota, uh, you know, we've had a long relationship with Toyota, and they... they uh, well, well, didn't you appoint Dr. Toyota to your board at some point? Yeah, uh, that's a different Toyota. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, but I'll come back to that. They'll yeah. remind me not to. But uh, Toyota, of course, has great manufacturing vendor and processing quality and stuff. And so uh, we asked them if they'd come help us with our setting up our quality processes, our working with our vendors and things like that. And, you know, they'd send teams of 10 people over for two weeks at a time until we kind of got some of the basics together, right? And so uh, we've had a lot of support from the uh, same way Kamatsu, who was a joint venture partner. So we've had a lot of support from these uh, Japanese companies. It was interesting because uh, you told me this story once about uh, the getting into the LCD business. Oh, and, right. And, and you were driven to that. And you guys basically just made this, the agreement at Trade Partners Conference in Hawaii, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll go back a little bit further because you mentioned Dr. Toyota. Uh, we wanted to get a, um, uh, a Japanese board member. And the problem in trying to get a 
Japanese board member. One is going to speak English in those days. Uh, two, uh, uh, if you got one from Toshiba, NEC didn't like it. And uh, uh, if you got one from Hitachi and somebody else did. So, so we had to get a neutral. So it took us about three years. Iwasaki and I worked on this. And finally we came up with this fellow, Dr. Toyota. Dr. Toyota was the head of the LSI program for Japan uh, in the 70s, and then he was at the main uh, research uh, center for NTT. And he's a tall, really wonderful, wonderful, smart person. His father was the head of technology for uh, Hitachi when they were up on the coastal town, up a uh, little town of Hitachi as a... Um, and so he's a really sharp person, a wonderful wife, and just a great person. And so he joined our board and was a great contributor. But one of the things he contributed was he said, you know, you really ought to get serious about this liquid crystal, active matrix liquid crystal display business equipment. And we said, well, we don't know much about it, and we don't quite know how, but it's clear wafers were getting bigger. So maybe that'd be, we could look at that. And so uh, Iwasaki arranged for the head of Toshiba's semiconductor and the head of Sharp and myself and Dr. Toda to get together in Hawaii at the, what semi sponsors this trade partners conference uh, which got uh, companies from both sides uh, both semiconductor and equipment companies together and uh, we put together a deal to get us into the build equipment for uh, active make liquid, liquid crystal displays you know it's like a billion dollars in orders this year so it's a it's not a bad business, so we can thank Dr. Taylor. And it's also the lead into the into the solar business because same machines we or some of the same machines we can use to make a thin film solar cells. Well, that's a stroke of luck. So, an interesting thing about applied materials is, a long time ago, you decided to allocate what one percent of. Profits One percent, to yeah. philanthropy? Yeah, we, we, uh, we got the board to agree to uh, dedicate 1% of pre-tax profits to uh, community uh, types of things, education. Things now, you like did that, that in 78. Who was doing that in 78? <laughs> I don't know. We just thought it was important. And at that time, we supported the United Way. That was one of the bigger ones. And uh, it was interesting to see because... At times when we were having uh, labor force re uh, labor reductions, we were at the same time getting increased donations from our employees because they felt that other people were probably having a tougher time than they were. So mm -hmm. I, it's really built a culture. It's part of the culture. It's been, I think, a kind of a real important part of, a, of applied. Well, in a way, it's created some opportunities to you because... You then invested at some point in the nature of conservancy, and then that kind of give you the understanding of the energy issues to lead you to solar. Well, actually, Applied directly didn't ever participate in, in the nature conservancy. Uh, we tended to focus more on things related to our communities mm -hmm. that we're in. Um, but, it, you know, for example, we did, a, uh, we've done several programs, a lot of you know about here, the, the Tech Museum and uh, the Center for Science, Technology, and Society, and, and a lot of the education programs. But overseas, we tried to help in those areas, and, and you've seen a couple of them. One was the, the breast cancer uh, climb on Mount Fuji, which kind of got huge publicity all around the world because breast cancer is not very well not talked about in, in, in Japan, so all the press covered it everywhere. We probably got I don't know how many millions of hits on that on that story. But, for example, one of the things we did is we put a million dollars into the Shanghai Research Fund to support, this is back in the 90s, to support early uh, just testing and stuff like that. And so that was really, uh, so it was a little bit of money, sometimes 50. As a result, we got huge numbers of really great people out of there. So, so it's paid off. It's been a great thing. But the Nature Conservancy is something I've kind of done personally. Now you find it. Interesting when you get out there in those organizations and you meet people you wouldn't meet through the normal connections in the industry? Yeah, I think it pays to work with some, uh, at least one nonprofit. I kind of never did more than one, but I think you learn, 
you learn some management ideas. You learn to look at the world from a different view. I mean, it's been exciting to me with the huge explosion potential for applied in solar, uh, kind of in parallel with the real focus of the world on the environmental, which I'm seeing through the Nature Conservancy, where I'm on the board, uh, global board. Uh, you know, it's kind of like a fire hose of information coming at you, and uh, it's exciting and fun, and it just kind of gives you a sense of just a huge potential that's out there. Why don't we roll into the future? You've you know, there's lots of issues today around globalization. Uh, you've been there, done it. What do you think about globalization? Well, I, I think it's here to stay. Uh, uh, only, uh, I mean, if you, all you had to do was to, I don't know how many of you took a trip through the Eastern Europe after the walk, or about the time when you could get in there. But, you see what happens if you don't engage and compete. Uh, uh, I mean, it's just sad. Especially uh, when you go there today, because if you were there then, yeah, right. you go there today. Right. It's yeah. Such an amazing turn. Yeah. And somewhat same way in China. I mean, that's been an amazing transformation. But 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 I think uh, I think you have to compete, and I think the danger we have with these trade agreements, where we're trying to beat up on these trade agreements, you may need to modify them some and stuff like that. I'm not saying that, but not to engage, to think you can not compete, you can, uh, you can survive by isolating yourself is stupid because there's no way. Uh, because the, you just think about applied. Why did we become really good as a competitor? Because we took the standard of the best customer and also our best competitor on any product or any service anywhere in the world and made that our standard of excellence. And so we have three, we have three core values. One is close to the customer. Number two is mutual trust and respect, both internally and with our customer and partners and competitors and stuff. And third is world-class performance. Well, you're not going to have world-class performance if you don't know what it is. And so if you look at the companies that, are get, that get killed is when they ignore what their competitors are doing. I mean, you've seen what happens to the auto industry and, and other industries. So you have, to be, you have to engage in order to know how to compete. That's why I really always like to have a few competitors. I just didn't want them too strong. <laughs> So at this point, I think it's time to uh, pass the cards out to the side, and they'll collect them and bring them up here. It's already done? <laughs> okay. There come. <laughs> okay, while she's doing that, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, ask you one of you, you know, there's, uh, they call them morganisms over at Applied Materials, but... Uh, you know, what I can learn from you, I can write a book, but um, you have this great saying, good news is no news, no news is bad news, and bad news is good news. <laughs> right, that's true. <laughs> and I think people always go, what? <laughs> well, you know, they always give you good news, so good news is really no news, right? Uh, I mean, no, you can't, you know they're going to give you the good news. Uh, probably four times, I mean. If, there's, if, if I run into three, three people and there's good news, I'll get it from all three of them if they know about it, right? So, but no news is really bad news because, boy, if you don't, if you, I start panicking. You watch me begin to get agitated if, if it's quiet. I just really get nervous. And the bad news I just love because you can do something about it. And so we kind of went through, and all, all the top, at least the top couple of us that worked together so closely over the years, they were different. But we just, fortunately, were lucky never to have a big surprise, negative surprise. And I think it's because, you know, we got, people weren't afraid to talk about the, the bad news. And in fact, it was sort of honored. Uh, we weren't, we, we didn't give you, we, we were waiting to get a piece of bad news, so they'd always try to give you one. Of course, and lots of times there's more than you wanted, but uh, that's a different problem. <laughs> but you got to do something about it. That's the key. So uh, um, 
The first question here is, Jim, what country will be your biggest customer in 10 years from now? And, and it's uh, today in five years and 20 years. Probably China. Um, you know, there'll be a, I mean, as we get into solar and uh, uh, light emitting diodes and some of these other businesses, we'll have a market. We'll be in countries we weren't in before, but but I think probably China, unless it has some big, really long-term hiccup, um, is really poised to be a major, major factor. I, of course, I may be a little biased because I, I went there early uh, in the opening. Uh, Jiang Zemin, the, uh, at that time was Vice Minister of Electronics, visited Applied Materials in 1983. And he happened to get his promotion through the, or we at least heard about it, through the, uh, the consulate in San Francisco uh, that day. They was promoted to minister electronics. So Dr. Benzine and, and Bob Graham, myself and several others, we took him to uh, Ming's in Palo Alto, the old Ming's, and, uh, and had dinner with him. And we talked and, uh, uh, clearly, to me, he had a vision. He and I were about 6% apart on a vision of where high tech and Asia was going to go over the next 5, 10 years. And it was just a great uh, awakening for me. So he was my host when I went there the next year. And we set up a service group there, and, and we sort of struggled along for several years. And uh, and then as they have moved forward in technology, clearly we got a big opportunity out of that, but uh, it was, uh, I think it's, it's, it's incredible. I've been a lot of places there, and, and they're really a, a very exciting, a lot of exciting things are going on. There's a story that you had your son live with a Japanese farm family to really learn the culture. Is it true? Actually, I, you know, I, I, I had, uh, I haven't had that much influence on my son except to Kind of, he's sort of independent for those of you who know him. Uh, but he, I did expose both he and Mary to people from other cultures, and and they both picked up on that, fortunately. And in Jeff's case, he uh, he was at Cornell in architecture school, and he came to work, work for me here, who I saw. Where are you, me here at, at Hewlett Packard, and he tried to get Hewlett Packard to send him to Japan, and they wouldn't send him to Japan. So he went skiing for three three months in Val d'Isere, and uh, got a and went over to Japan and got a, a green card. And uh, Ann Brannon, who was somebody that applied, uh, had a place up in the mountains, and she let him stay there. No heat. And he had an English or Japanese English teacher teach him Japanese, and he worked as construction. And then he got a job with Mitsui, and he stayed there two years. So that's how he got got his Japanese experience. <laughs> and I didn't have much to do with it. <laughs> so, if 1967, the year that Applied was founded, was a year in which changed the real dynamics of the semiconductor industry, was 2007 the year that Applied began building solar cell production equipment? A similarly significant year for the solar industry? Well, we hope so. Uh, <laughs> uh, Franz, did you write this one? <laughs> uh, uh, no, I, I uh, as I look ahead, I really is, uh, I, I'm as excited about the next couple decades as I was in the early 80s about the next couple decades. Uh, uh, this... Um, you know, the whole tech thing is going to continue to grow, but uh, a lot of the areas in thin films and things like that are just right up your alley, and if we do a good job, which we should, um, you know, we should lead in uh, in silicon solar cells and also in thin film solar cells. So those would really be a great opportunity for the company uh, if we, we just can uh, capitalize on the opportunities there because we've been preparing for it for 40 years, so it's not like we aren't, uh, we don't have a capability to take advantage of because you need some core things. You need thin film capability, need the ability to kind of do really sophisticated large-scale machines, 
you need the capability to distribute and support those around the world. And probably as important as anything, you need a global culture inherent in your organization. And, and I mean, we have all four of those in spades. And it just, uh, so it's ours to lose, and I hope we don't. That's an um, interesting segue into the next question, and that is, is how did you think of KLA Tencor or other competitors? What model do you use or have of competition in the marketplace? And I actually know the answer to that one because one day I called you and you said, we really, I'd been in an annual meeting, and you said, we really didn't have any competition. And I came over to have lunch with you and I said, Jim, that's the most arrogant thing you've ever said. Can you explain yourself? And I don't know if you remember what you told me. <laughs> no, but you told me, well, I really feel that way. Uh, I've always felt like the biggest competitor was ourselves, not oh, the other true. guys. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think you, I think you kind of misframed the front of that question. Because <laughs> at least in public, I would always say that we have an enormous competition around the world. And, and that's part of one of our disclaimers that goes up at the beginning of any investor conference. <laughs> but uh, but I, actually, the thing that frustrated me probably the most in the 30 years around the party is that we were always our number uh, two competitor, and I, I just hated that. Uh, because if we, we lost because we screwed it, I mean, we didn't quite do what we could, had the potential of doing. Uh, and, and the others are good. We have good competitors, but that was why we tended to lose. I mean, somebody like KLA has kind of been the leader in the area, so we've just been trying to catch up with them. But some of the others, we kind of, once we got in the lead, we had an advantage. Well, it's definitely along the comment you made about solar, and that is, is it's yours to lose. Right. And, and it's always been a fascinating part, and something that I learned about you is, is or from you is, is if you're following if you're if you're following and chasing after your competitors, you're just going to always be behind them. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I, I really encourage our people to focus on where we're going. You, you have to understand what your competitors are and so forth. But really, if we get the right strategies, our competitors will either be successful or not. But we can't make a hell of a lot of impact on them. But we if we do our things right, we'll probably get the opportunity. Yeah. Last question here. If you could do one thing differently, better, obviously, what would that be? You'll get younger, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> so, kind of like take us on again. I mean, you know, or something. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it'd be great. To, it'd be great today's world to be 45. Wow, there's just so much going on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, there's business product areas or so forth we might have done done differently, but uh, I I really enjoyed what I did. Um, uh, I was lucky to have really terrific people to work with the whole uh, all the way along, and and you know we were fortunate to um, get the opportunities and take advantage of them. And, and it was fun. We had a lot of, lot of, I mean, we worked awful hard, but we had a lot of fun. And uh, saw a lot of interesting things, got to know a lot of interesting people. Um, I don't know as I'd do it much differently. Well, Jim, thank you very much for a delightful evening. Sure. Thanks. Thank Before I thank our guests, I'd like to ask you, remind you about the survey. We got a lot of people from the technology industry here, and uh, you all know how important data is and information. And so uh, just a few questions about how you got here this evening, what you think of the evening, a little bit about yourself uh, in three different sections there. If you could fill that out, it would be a great help for us and hand it in before you leave tonight. Thank you. And uh, I have one uh, small memento for each of you. Uh, Core Memory, which is a oh, picture book of uh, 
great shots of uh, various things in our collection. Oh, good. That, uh, represent the industry. I think you'll find very good. Good. Very Thanks. Interesting. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.